do a quick intro and we'll get the discussion started here. Hello and welcome. My name is Shannon Kemp and I'm the Executive Editor of Dataversity. We would like to thank you for joining our second installment of the new monthly Dataversity webinar series, NoSQL Now with Dan McCurry. Today Dan will be discussing optimizing databases for solid state drives with three guest panelists today. Just a couple of points to get us started. Due to the large number of people that attend these sessions, you will be muted during the webinar. For questions, we will be collecting them via the Q&A in the bottom right-hand corner of your screen, or if you like to tweet, we encourage you to share highlights or questions via Twitter using hashtag NoSQLNow. As always, we will send a follow-up email within two business days containing links to the recording of this session and any additional information requested throughout the webinar. Today we have three esteemed guests just joining the panel for the discussion, Dave Rosenthal, co-founder of Foundation DB, Brian Bulkowski, founder and CTO of Aerospike Incorporated, and Tim Callahan, Vice President of Engineering at Toku Tech. I think their title alone speak to their impressive resumes. Moderating the panel is Dataversity's partner and friend, Dan McCurry. Dan is principal of Kelly McCurry & Associates. He is an enterprise architect and author specializing in mer emerging database technologies. And he and his wife, Anne, recently published the book, Making Sense of NoSQL, A Guide for Managers and the Rest of Us. We can find in the Dataversity bookstore under Featured Books. And with that, we'll turn over the floor to Dan to get the discussion started. Hello and welcome. Sorry about that. Forgot to unmute myself. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> All right. We're set. Oh. So I, just, I just wanted to uh, uh, reach out and thank our panelists um, at our at the NoSQL Now conference. Um, we had uh, three very good um, present presentations done uh, by people that have been pretty much writing their databases from scratch uh, using solid state drives. And so I wanted to invite um, uh, some of the leaders in this area and uh, really talk about why uh, these databases don't can't just run can't be uh, modified very quickly to run on solid state drives. I think there's a lot of very new and very deep technology that these guys are working with. So I'm really honored to have all three of you guys here. Uh, we'll just start out going left to right, um, and we'll have each of you guys just introduce yourselves and and maybe uh, just tell us a little bit about how you got into the solid state drive area. Um, and then uh, we'll go on from there. So, Dave, would you like to get us uh, started off here? Yeah, and thanks for having me. So, yeah, my name is Dave Rosenthal. I'm one of the co-founders and sort of architects and technologists behind FoundationDB. And uh, we've been working on, you know, building a database, as have these other guys, for uh, a little over four years now, in my case. Uh, sort of designed from day one for SSDs. And uh, when, when we got started, these Intel X25 drives were sort of just out on the market, and for the first time, you know, SSDs were looking looking so viable, and they had these you know, some weird some weird characteristics in terms of you know write performance versus read performance, and I'm sure we'll get into all of that. But uh, one of the things I think we realized is, is that uh, you sort of need to design a database a little bit differently uh, to use SSDs than you would in a normal rotational disk. So um, Looking forward to the conversation. I personally done a bunch of the sort of our testing on various SSDs. You know, you know, buy everything on the market. I have a box full of literally hundreds of dead SSDs that we've beaten to the ground. So um, <laughs> it's been fun. Thanks. All right, uh, Ryan. How tell us about yourself and, and where you're from and how long what got you into solid state drives? Thanks, Dan. It's a good opportunity to be able to speak here, and I appreciate. So um, I was working at a advertising company back in the 2007-2008, um, uh, and I really saw an opportunity to help companies cope with scale. Uh, I saw people trying to achieve things that were like the front page of Yahoo at the time, but trying to do it as a startup with only a few people, and really running into a lot of problems. And you could do all that stuff within memory databases at the time, true RAM databases, and that's what really a lot of people did. Uh, 
but solid state was going to be the coming uh, technology, which was really going to radically change technology. So uh, I'm in my late 40s, and I've been you know blocked in terms of high performance from doing uh, by storage for a long, long time. We've all been living with um, seeks being very slow in databases for pretty much most of our lives. So Flash is a super exciting technology, and when we looked at the price performance of Flash, especially as um, Dave mentioned with the Intel X25s, um, th there was a lot of possibilities there. Uh, I started also then talking to a guy I knew a couple companies back named David Flynn, who ended up being one of the founders of Fusion IO. So he told me a lot about the underlying chip architecture and what firmware had to do for every drive. So we really started um, uh, optimizing the uh, data structures in our ground up rewrite at that point. Well, fantastic. And so for people that, that uh, don't know about Fusion IO, uh, they're a company that really does focus on the actual hardware themselves. Is that a, a good summary? Absolutely. They are one of the preeminent um, uh, uh, PCIe card flash vendors that really took a look at um, how to do direct attached storage in that card. Now, of course, there are many vendors from uh, Violin now has a similar kind of product out. Micron has some great products. Uh, we now have the uh, Huawei card on the bench. We're actually very excited about some of that performance. And uh, like Dave, we do a a lot of testing. We have a tool called ACT, the Aerospike Certification Tool. We run a lot of drives through that and a lot of configurations, whether it be wide SATA or PCIe for performance, and really try to show you know where different vendors are in terms of price performance, especially with low latency. Right, right, okay. Okay, so Tim, tell us a little bit about yourself and how you got into solid state drives. Sure. Um, I, you know, me on Twitter, I, I call it the database junkie. After graduating college, I was doing DBase and Clip early on. Um, discovered Oracle and wrote my first SQL and pledged to do any more Clipper development uh, for a very long time. And then um, went over to VoltDB for a couple of years okay. in product management and, um, and engineering and really fell in love with the high performance characteristics of a, of a free memory database. Um, and then discovered TokuDB a few years later, uh, TokuTech. So um, what we have here is, is, a, is a technology called Fractal Tree Indexes. And um, the, the story from an SSD perspective, I think it's unique on the panel in that uh, to be, and the, and the Fractal Tree Indexes themselves were built in a time when, when uh, running disks uh, really old and SSD was much further down the horizon compared to where it is today. So, so uh, the Fractal Tree Index compared to a B tree is all about eliminating unnecessary I.O. Given the expense of an I.O. operation, um, it was critical to try to avoid that as much as possible. So, so trees were born uh, really to solve a problem with spinning disks. An interesting side effect that we found uh, is, is aspects that we baked into the fractal tree, you know, number one being compression. SSD, I'm sure we'll talk about this later. Um, SSDs are really expensive. So compressing the data that goes on them, I think, goes a long way toward making them affordable for, for you know, your standard end users. Um, other interesting um, aspect of an SSD is, uh, you know, you can almost say that IOPS are free. Uh, devices like Fusion IO can do 100,000 plus uh, IO operations per second, but there are expenses that come with that IOPS. So you, you can get data very quickly, but then you've got to decompress it, deserialize it, put it into the hash, inject other um, items. So, so the freeness of an IOPS is kind of deceiving. And when I say free, it's in quotes because I mentioned earlier about compression. They're real expensive devices themselves, or they can be very expensive. Uh, and last uh, piece about our technology is uh, someone earlier mentioned having stacks of drives that they've just run into the ground. Uh, for the tree indexes um, do things that are really interesting. We do infrequent writing, and we write we write big things. And I think they'll make uh, our technology very, very SSD friendly and can eliminate the, the concerns about wearing out uh, devices before time. Thank you very much, Tim. That's great. So I'm going to go on to a couple of questions. And, and we're, I guess the format initially is we're going to just do a rammed format. We'll, we'll, we'll pick a question, and then each of you uh, answer it in turn. And then we'll kind of uh, break it up and get more uh, uh, interactive uh, after these first round rounds. So let, let's just start out with uh, WOW. Why is it that SSDs are becoming popular now, and why is it that we're seeing a whole new generation of vendors that are rewriting their software from scratch? 
Uh, Dave, do you want to uh, make a shot at those uh, that in initial question? Yeah, I'll take a stab. I mean, so I'm getting an echo there, though. So apologies. Um, I think becoming popular. I mean, I mean, I think we sort of all know the reasons. They're a little bit. Um, so don't just say that you know the price has been coming down and the performance is going up. Um, it's like that's sort of the obvious stuff. Uh, one of the interesting things that's happened just over the past um, maybe year, in, from my perspective in the SSD market, is there's been um, a lot of maturing of the controller technology on the SSDs uh, to the point where different SSDs from different vendors are, are finally starting to work pretty well in just one workload or, you know, of streaming rights or streaming reads or pure random reads or pure random writes. They're starting to work better in real-world workloads of random reads and random writes that are mixed together. And they're starting to work better when they're, like, full. One of the things that's interesting about SSDs is they, um, and we'll talk about this, normally there's they're, they're spare capacity that's over-provisioned inside the SSD. And uh, to, to sort of work well, they need to have some spare capacity to work with. And one of the challenges with existing SSDs is that if you fill them up, they start to work worse and worse, especially for writes. So to me, interesting things about why SSDs are becoming popular in the last couple of years is there's actually been a little bit of a convergence around the capabilities of the um, flash translation layer and the, and the actual SSD controllers to make it so that different drives are becoming a little bit more commoditized and a little bit more interchangeable. I think we're still in a place as an industry where, you know, we as database vendors need to be experts on half of our customers about SSDs. But I think sort of rolling forward a few years, hopefully it'll be a little bit more commoditized, um, much like, for example, a 10,000 RPM rotational disk is today. And I'll leave you with that. I think your, your summary uh, is that it's not just the underlying uh, technology of the solid state memory itself, but it's actually the controllers that have been highly optimized for different workloads since then. Yeah, all controllers from the different manufacturers are starting to converge in terms of sort of capability. I mean, they're not converged, but they're converging in terms of capabilities. And so there's not like one drive is good for one thing and one drive is really good good for something else, it's starting to be a little bit more of an equilibrium, which makes them interchangeable in the market. So okay. that's really important. All right. Uh, tell us a little about what your, what's your take on it. Is it why, why SSDs now, and, and what, do you, what are the big trends you're seeing? Uh, first of all, I'd say that, you know, Dave said there is entirely accurate. We're seeing a lot of the same things. Um, let's highlight one point about the controller, which is as controller technology was has been maturing, you know, we saw uh, basically two or three companies come out like um, Sandforce and say, we are the controller company trying to cut across the uh, a lot of different manufacturers. Um, and that was sort of a one size all fits all approach. And, you know, honestly, I think it's it, it was good for the time, but we're starting to surpass that. So the fact that Micron has its own controller and has its own driver, the fact that Intel has uh, basically had two different products for controllers, and then you know one of those was clearly superior and it moved forward. Um, Huawei, again, uh, as I mentioned, has a really interesting controller that's little known in the U.S., but it's their own silicon. Um, well, at least their own uh, FPGA. Uh, Samsung as well has its own controller. So all of these, that's a process that takes years of, you know, spilling up the, spinning up the design phase, going through multiple uh, multiple revs of controller tech. We're really starting to see the benefit of it. Um, but frankly, I think there's two other issues that really have to be highlighted, and one is simple acceptance. Your friends say, oh yeah, I installed SSDs, I installed flash technology, it worked, it didn't burn out, uh, they do seem to be more reliable than rotational disks for this workload. Um, you know, then, then that's a, a mounting range of evidence. As, as operational people are, are hearing from their friends that now flash is working, uh, where, uh, you know, the X25 was a little, you know, had some problems, it was pretty easy to burn out, uh, it had problems with disconnects and stuff like that. Uh, you know, that word of mouth is, is priceless for the industry. And then the, uh, the other point is simple, simple price. Um, you know, the, the range, the difference between what RAM cost and flash cost 
we now have devices like the um, Crucial M5 500, which is Micron, uh, Micron's uh, consumer brand, currently being priced at half a dollar a gig. We have rumors that um, Facebook's Exabyte that they are buying is probably around a buck a gig. Um, Apple's big build out uh, rumors I have is also around 50 cents a gig. This is a far cry from the $15 a gig that the early Fusion IO cards cost. And we're now seeing the high end of the market in um, SLC drives at about $8 a gig. So price has really plummeted and densities have increased as well as that word of mouth. Uh, Brian, tell us what SL, SLC drives are. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, there are two sort of core technologies. There's a lot of the different chip vendors uh, have some other terms, um, but the, the two acronyms to know in flash uh, chip technology are SLC, uh, which is um, uh, uh, single cell, and uh, MLC, which is multi-cell. So MLC drives tend to be quite slower, but also quite a bit denser and cheaper. SLC drives are especially good at high write endurance as well as high write throughput. So you tend to see them at, uh, at uh, uh, different PC levels. Uh, so far, the industry the industry has really shifted in the last year and a half to be almost entirely MLC based. Now, there's there's a I, I'm, I'm sort of drawing some. Uh, imagine me waving my hands a little because there's TLC, which is you know the, the tri-state stuff that Samsung's got out, and uh, uh, Intel has this stuff that they call ELC, which is also a little different. So there's been some uh, process improvements at the chip guys that they like to highlight. But there's sort of two big families, MLC and SLC. And the SLC drives are currently running 50 cents to three bucks a gig chip price, and it's really rippled throughout the industry. So there's underlying technologies, and each of these tech underlying technologies have different characteristics for read and write performance. Definitely. Interesting. Okay. We're also seeing, um, uh, just because we're sort of on this topic, um, uh, the flash memory um, uh, conference down in San Jose uh, a couple months ago, we saw both Samsung and Intel present some very interesting roadmaps that show uh, real legs on SLC, de uh, sorry, uh, uh, flash density. We can expect about 10 years worth of Moore's Law style uh, every 18 months 2x improvement. Improvement uh, style. So they've shown uh, some some internal so, some very uh, believable process improvements that will take us through at least a, the next factor of 10 to factor of 16 of scaling. Mm, that's good news. Good news. All right, uh, Tim, tell tell us your thoughts on uh, why SSD now and, and what are the trends you're, you're seeing. I've got things. You know, I can certainly iterate price. You know, I, I think nothing drives adoption more than affordability. Uh, the masses now, you can get quality, you know, for off the shelf devices that is safe to run databases on. If you're a lot of feedback. I, uh, let's, maybe some people that are not talking, if you could turn your phones on mute. That's that, uh, any better? Yep. That's not solid now. So the, 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 the props, you know, that some places I'm hearing mention, you know, Fusion and others, you know, there, there's there's high-end flat devices, PCBs, there, there's high-end enterprise-grade SSDs, and there's consumer off-the-shelf of, of you can buy, you know, PCI flashcards that are constrained and, and, and SSDs and kind of roll your own servers with those. Price a lot. Um, I think that what's changed is there's been a fair amount of, of FUD, of uncertainty and doubt, about the devices wearing out. I think people think about, well, uh, this, this device can only be rewritten each set in the device a thousand times or two thousand times. And you have and you might really concern to think if my database is running at peak, I'm going to wear this device out in, in months or you know, be a short number of years, and I'm going to be repeating these devices, and I might have own time. Um, I personally am still scouring the Internet to find evidence that in, uh, in large quantities, um, these devices are wearing out, and, and we've seen enough of that for that concern to be as valid as uh, as any reported. But the piece that I can certainly speak to uh, in terms of their expense and uh, and usage in the market is the raw performance it brings to your workload. So you know, we make a product that competes with with uh, with SQL and the InnoDB storage engine, which is is one way to store data is SQL, uh, and my SQL. If your data's uh, large fits in memory, it's a very performant database. Um, it tends to slow down quite a bit when the database is larger than RAM. 
and find these uh, these devices and SSDs doing is really using the bar for prints in MySQL or MongoDB for that matter when, when you've got really performant flash on the background. So rather than going to main memory to get data to operate on it, um, a flash device that can really improve performance. It's as good as in memory performance, but it's certainly far better than when going to a, a spinning disk for um, your workload. So I find that the, the biggest thing there is people for not a lot of money can have a new server that's got better storage, be it SSDs or or PI flashcards, and they might have a, a 5x performance improvement um, just for you know, no application change, no, no, no substantial changes other than better hardware. Right, that makes sense. Um, but I think what we're going to do is we're going to stick with you, Tim, and instead of going from left to right, we'll just uh, start continue another question, uh, Tim, and then we'll work back backwards. Um, I think one of the 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 things I'm struck with now we really talked about the underlying technology, but let's just talk about the database itself now. Um, why is it we can't just take our database as is and create a new drive and mount our data section uh, on that drive and just turn it on? Um, you guys are spending a huge amount of engineering dollars and research, uh, anything that, that you you really can't uh, that you are rewriting things. Uh, Tim, talk a little bit about why you, you really had to redo things from, from scratch. I think you know. I, I think Toku Tech is really unique on this panel in that way. In the, our, our technology existed pre-flash, and there were aspects of our implementation that lend themselves to work very well on Flash. But but there's one area where I can certainly speak to, and it's kind of a challenge in that um, I know that our compression, uh, compare competition in the MySQL and Mongo space is really compelling. And you know, we've heard uh, the name Fusion I know, kicked around or, or some of the high-end devices. They're really expensive. And at 10 to 1 compression on your data uh, with a live running transactional processing database, then suddenly you're going to make one-tenth the investment in the flash. So the expensive flash, you can 10 times as much data, or you spend one-tenth the money to get the same work done. And, um, but the challenge with, with compression, and, and that's what I can speak to uh, directly here, is, is um, it, it's moving um, the problem. So when, when we did really deep compression, in Tokutex, uh, TokuDB, if you had to do an I.O. to bring the data off disk, let's say you'd measure that in the milliseconds, five milliseconds or so, to read uh, a chunk of data off the disk. And with the hardest, you know, the, the great impression, something like LZMA, it might take 40 seconds to decompress that data. Um, so in the, in the pipeline of the operation, if I need to get data off disk, it's five milliseconds to get data and um, a couple of orders of magnitude less to actually decompress it. Uh, flash world, suddenly that I.O. Is, is nearly free. So let's say the I.O. is measured in microseconds. Now my decompression takes just longer than the, the initial I.O. operation. I've kind of moved my bottleneck and the expectation of speed, you know, they get much faster I.O. so they want to go even faster and then it becomes a challenge of balancing how you do for compression and how much time you spend um, affects the running workload. So it, it makes for an interesting challenge, and sometimes I'm finding that um, an easier, lightweight compression algorithm might be better on Flash because of latency it's, it's, uh, when you do an I.O. So, so the challenge we're facing with, with the Flash. The, the depression and the compression uh, then starts to take over and dominate the access times, uh, and we're really careful about that. The I, uh, the I.O. time has gone from milliseconds to microseconds, and therefore has now, now it, it used to dwarf decompression, and now it is dwarfed by decompression. Okay. And just to be, uh, you mentioned uh, uh, MySQL and Mongo. You, you guys basically build a layer of software that um, serves as an intermediary. People uh, uh, write to Mongo API, for example, but they're in fact using uh, your software for as the driver uh, to all the I.O. Is that a good summary? An easier way to think of it is um, you, you, you can think of Toku MX as a, as a 
fork, for lack of a better term, of MongoDB. So it's we started with their code, source code. It's, with their API, we fully compatible with the functionality. So you know, Tokenic is to MongoDB what TokuDB is to MySQL. It's okay. You know, they're plug-in um, alternatives. But, but now you have your basically your own code base. Uh, uh, people that have a Mongo database could just put over and use the same API effectively. Exactly. Okay, great. All right, let's Brian, uh, tell us a little about uh, why is it that we can't just take a, a database designed for spinning disk and have it run on a solid state drive? Well, first of all, that's a great question. Um, and the short answer is you can. Um, you know, uh, I've mentioned Fusion IO a couple times, but their big selling point was they just said, hey, look, use one of our cards underneath Oracle or MySQL. And guess what? You can make your uh, all of your hardware spend and all of your, your application two to three times faster. Uh, it'd be nice to just you know sprinkle some magic hardware pixie dust over your databases and not have to increase your Oracle license fee or do anything other than simply install some cards. And so, that's so that's the, a the wonderful story. Is the, is, is the ballpark there? But you, can you do better? Well, exactly. That's 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 the rule of thumb I, when I've talked to people who have optimized, uh, you know, operations guys. Um, uh, the point is that uh, the number of IOPS in these drives, we've talked about them being free, have moved up from, you know, a, a rule of thumb for a nice uh, swank recent enterprise drive is maybe 200 IOPS, 200 in, um, IOs per second, to maybe 400 for fast drives if you've, you know, for a rotational disk. And uh, uh, flash devices started out at maybe 10,000 and 20,000 in the early days with the X25 and have moved up to hundreds of thousands today, um, even for modestly priced drives. So, um, you know, that's a huge difference to go from 200 to 20,000, right? That's a factor of 100, not a factor of two. So when we looked at building Aerospike, we said, um, you know, what, what's actually going to unlock all 20,000 of those IOPS? How can we get out? of the way, how can we invoke the parallelism necessarily for flash devices? And it turns out that due to the internal architecture of the controllers and the chips, with a rotational drive, you've got one head, seek to one place, and you do that read, and then you get out of town. Um, that's one of the, um, and, and so staging, doing elevator optimization algorithms were a big part of rotational drive optimizations for the last 20, 30 years. Um, with flash, you really do have um, random and parallel access. So the first thing we did was we worked out a very uh, a, a RAM-based indexing scheme that was incredibly efficient because a RAM system will be highly parallel uh, allows you to get through the index, allows you to um, actually uh, do writes to that index if you have to shuffle and rebalance whatever you're doing. Um, you don't have to do different kind of locks if you use a proper lock-free algorithm. So that unlocks then the ability to, at the device level, do multiple reads and writes in parallel and really unlock the throughput of a drive and get yourself up to the full rated chip throughput of the drive. And so uh, those and a few other techniques, such as using streaming writes to the device to make sure it doesn't invoke its own internal garbage collection system, um, those are some of the te techniques we've used as well as parallel. Uh, the goal is really to get the drives running at their at their full rated speed according to manufacturer and according to synthetic testing. If you can do that and really get to your hundreds of thousands per second, um, then you're you're doing something right and you're you're going beyond the two x uh, to three x of putting your uh, relational system and just dropping it in some new hardware. Interesting. Okay, great. Uh, Jay, you want to uh, take a crack at that question then? On mute here, Dave. Yeah, thank you. I, I was. Yes. <laughs> um, I was. I was just commenting with the other panelists on their excellent answers. Um, I, I will definitely echo some of the same things. You know, it is it is awfully disappointing to drop an SSD into a database and make it and have it get two or three times faster. Um, you're sort of that's not what I expected. I, I wanted some zeros. You know, um, at the end of that. So, you know. What we find is that well-engineered systems have balanced bottlenecks, and so a well-engineered database 10 years ago balanced the bottlenecks between you know compression and decompression and seeks and scans and all of this stuff. But when you go move something like three orders of magnitude, that obviously goes uh, out of whack. So it's taken a little bit of time um, for everybody to figure that out. 
uh, drilling in on sort of one of the deeper issues uh, from this, like, if you asked people, um, like, four years ago, how would you take advantage of an SSD in a database, uh, the answer, and, you know, you find papers on this, you know, SSD optimized, you know, data structures, the answer was to do sort of log, a log structured merge style um, access pattern, something that does random reads to the flash disk, but sort of is uh, aware of the fact that flash can't do small block random writes. It has to actually um, erase big chunks of, mem of flash. So basically, it, it has a hard time um, natively doing random small writes. And so we're saying, if, well, if you can read randomly from Flash and write sequentially to Flash and structure your data store in, a, in that way, then it'll work much better with Flash. One of the sort of, I guess, thesis we had uh, back when we started FoundationDB is that that was not going to be the case forever. Uh, that, that that problem of turning random writes into sequential writes using a log structured log structure techniques going to um, ultimately be solved, again, at the controller level, not, not to harp on the controllers here. And I think that's what we see. Um, so if you look back to the rotational disk days, they could random reads and random writes basically at the same speed. And um, there was some Q depth effect, like, for example, the drive might be able to get about three times faster if you get a very, very big list of things to do versus giving it one thing at a time to do. Um, what's been interesting about the evolution of SSDs is as the controllers have improved, um, internally they're solving some of these log-structured problems. So today, an SSD does look actually an awful lot like a faster disk. Um, it's a, a roughly equal number of random reads and random writes. And the biggest difference is, other than just sort of the orders of magnitude of performance, is, is the QDEPTH effect. Uh, an SSD might be able to run five or even ten times faster if you get a big list of um, items to read and write versus doing one at a time. And from what I've uh, been told about people, you know, TOs at some of these um, uh, companies that sell these, these uh, memory cards, uh, what we're going to be seeing in the future is even more IOs per second. Again, IOs being free and flash. Um, but you're going to need to drive more and more concurrency uh, to an actual flash device to get that performance. So I think in terms of thinking ahead to challenges for us, um, writing random 4K blocks it isn't much of a challenge, but the challenge from us as software vendors is to be able to provide like hundreds potentially of, of parallel requests going to one of these flash devices at the same time. Good. Fantastic. So let me, let me uh, just uh, remind everybody uh, that we're at uh, about about 1.30 here uh, in the Midwest, and we want everybody uh, to put in questions that they have for our panelists here. We have some of the uh, best experts in the field here, so uh, always good to get some free advice. Um, then uh, we're, we're going to uh, keep the discussion going for about 20 more minutes, and then we'll open it up for questions. Um, so I'm going to just kind of open it up now, and if anybody – would like to talk about, uh, in, in any order you guys want, um, any case studies of industries that are really starting to benefit from uh, these, this new generation of databases. Um, anybody just been here, and, and if you have any uh, case studies that you'd like to mention and some success stories, any industry specifically, too? I'm happy to. We've got a lot of these things in production. Uh, you have, have any, any specific uh, uh, industry segments? That you guys were oh, yeah. I just wanted to see if the other panelists uh, might want to jump in as well. So um, the industry that we've been um, very successful in is with advertising and marketing technology companies. Uh, we're now starting to find some uh, lift within retail sections and uh, companies as well. So uh, the primary use case is essentially user profile storage and uh, sort of session cookie tracking. Uh, these are the cases where you need um, for, say, advertising optimization or uh, personalization of a web experience, you'd like to have maybe 10 terabytes currently online, and you want to do that with a very high level of availability, and you're doing, you know, maybe 6 billion objects in a table. Um, that seems to be sort of uh, what a lot of our customers are doing, somewhere between 1 and 6 billion objects per table. Uh, and the use is very random across it. 
bit. Right? So uh, in cases where it's a very read-centric workload and uh, the working set is small, uh, you'll often find that existing uh, relational technologies are working pretty well. It's really where the working set size is expanding. Um, so with a flash oriented system like Aerospike, you can say, hey, look, your indexes are in memory, reasonable cost. Uh, we'll actually push, say, 100,000 uh, per uh, uh, machine, per node in a clustered system. Uh, right now, the use case of uh, called real-time bidding within advertising, advertising optimization, there are uh, nearly hundreds of companies participating in real-time bids for advertising impressions. So the you know, if you really want to visualize it, imagine you go to a web page and there's that little that little banner at the top or some holes on the side that may get filled with ads. Well, that just doesn't go to, you know, one computer that has, you know, a list of ads and serves you back one. There's a massive infrastructure where let's say that goes to Google as the first stop. Google may fill that ad or send it out for bid of maybe uh, 50 to 100 companies, all of which you have to respond uh, to that bid, um, and they usually do it within 10 milliseconds. So um, uh, that load is currently running at nearly 750,000 database requests per second. Sorry, um, um, advertising requests per second, 750,000. So imagine you want to play in that game if you're a company like AppNexus, one of our large customers, if you're uh, AOL's advertising group, another one of our customers, etc. And um, you, you actually want to be need to be able to push that on a regular second-by-second -second basis with 10 millisecond, um, and you've got to do your own math. So you've got one database lookup to do and then a lot of math to do to divide among all your campaigns which one is the optimal bid and at what price. So um, that use case where you've got to look up some user information, you've usually got a huge Hadoop stack on the back side, which is calculating for any given user, sweeping over all of its behavioral data every six hours to 24 hours, uh, updating segments, updating models, and putting that towards the front edge of your service. And then on this, uh, you know, at this very high throughput rate, uh, you're making uh, bids on these um, uh, advertising impressions. I also find cases in um, uh, market research and market retailing where um, companies like JP Morgan are using companies like X plus one to provide in-depth 360 degree customer view of uh, all of their uh, of, of everyone that comes to their website, people who have accounts to figure out how to place products. Um, X plus one is one of our customers that also uses Aerospike um, database and not quite in the advertising real time way, but uh, to do calculations and store all of the information and all of the recent behavior. So essentially, um, you know, sort of popping up the big picture for Aerospike, it's really really all about user interactions. And that's where you've got the level of read capabilities and write capabilities. You have a very large working set because it's everyone on the internet. And you have these big data uh, clusters, you know, Hadoop clusters and such out there, capable of generating very interesting uh, insights in what to place first. Very good. And, and the, the characteristic of that is that they need very, very fast response time for a request to uh, you, you know, bidding and having all those bids collected in under 10 milliseconds uh, seems like something that's that's going to be challenging to do if you have rotational disks in there. Uh, that that was really the first use case, and it was also a big driver of Flash. So our first customer who deployed us uh, nearly three years ago, um, uh, over three years ago, said uh, said to me on a call, he was like, "Look, um, the economics of my business simply do not support RAM." Uh, we've, we've done our modeling, and we know how much information we need to keep per user, and we know how much money we can make on the open market. And uh, RAM's just a non-starter. So um, with those guys and most of the guys in the advertising business, they are super uh, aware of what their TCO is, and they know that they can't lose money on every transaction and make it up in volume. They have to be making money on every transaction, and that means hardware cost. Um, but what we're also seeing now is companies like Facebook, right? So at the Flash Memory Summit a couple of months ago, uh, Facebook made the rather staggering admission in their keynote that they were buying an exabyte of flash storage this year. 
and available on, uh, on the slides from, the, from download from that site, Flash Memory Summit. And the reason they're doing it is not really this millisecond bidding case. It's about how to get uh, do all of the database requests necessary to prevent, present a really rich experience to Facebook customers. They've got photos to share and thumbnails and recent activity of other users. I mean, just imagine the, the massive number of uh, transactions required. So it, a part of it is about uh, the use cases we're seeing is about transactions per second and super low latency, but that's also coming into the rich web experiences as shown by Facebook's Buy and uh, some of Apple's recent work within uh, things like the iTunes Store and some of their online properties. It's about rich customer interactions, and that really drives database traffic. Dave or Tim, do you guys have any uh, uh, marks that you guys are, are getting into or, or case studies you'd like to share? Um, I'm brief. Um, I, I'm more of a, of a horizontal than a vertical from a market perspective. Um, we're, we're working with lots of customers and, and meet successful businesses of all sorts and sizes where they build an application on MySQL or on MongoDB and they're successful and they want to run faster. And, and I think by, by all measures, um, I is generally the bottleneck on, on MySQL and, and MongoDB applications, or it can be a, a big contributing bottleneck. Oftentimes, the, the, the attempt to write bottleneck is to put in Flash, put these, put in um, PCI flashcards. The challenge with, with doing that is um, we just talked about how it's expensive. Um, if are, let's call them cheap, it's definitely in the middle, I mean, and probably closer to RAM and spinning disks. So oftentimes we'll run into evaluators and customers who, who want to put Flash under their application to make it more performant. They're doing uh, OAP and they're doing OLAP on the same data, so they've got lots of reads and lots of writes going on. But you just can't afford Flash to solve their problem without compression. So you know, my, my horizontal here that I'm going to explain is just it's that type of customer, someone who Flash would solve their performance problem, but unfortunately makes their infrastructure too expensive to support application. And by introducing high compression, it kind of really equalizes that. If, um, if we 5x compression or 10x compression, suddenly um, getting one-fifth on the Flash you would in its compressed form, which is totally you know, uncompressed as MongoDB is. MongoDB does not do compression. And equal, while there's a compression option, you really don't use it because it severely takes the performance characteristics of MySQL. So that's what we're seeing lots of is customers who, who they've been successful, the app needs to go faster, flip them there, but Flash is too expensive in its own compressed form. And where um, TB and MX come in to, uh, to give the people um, ability through compression. So, so a su summary, if they're I.O. bound and they don't want to change their software stack, um, basically is your software uh, as an underlying thing. And, the, and for example, if they're running on Mongo, they'll just do a forklift upgrade to your software, and, and uh, they don't have to change their API, and they'll get much faster uh, throughput. Yeah, generally changing the software stack is going to be, you know, magnitude more expensive than the that might have um, in the same application stack. Okay. All right, so Dave, let's uh, run it up with you here. Tell, tell me what industries you guys are look, looking at seeing opportunities. Yeah, we I think we probably run into a lot of the same industries as the other guys, uh, consumer, consumer net, uh, finance, some games. But I'll sort of try to – I'm interested in, in addressing this pricing question, and I'll sort of try to tell you something that I tell a lot of the customers of Foundation DB across verticals, and that about to flash – that you know, you really just have to figure out whether it works with the cost structure of your business. Um, and uh, a lot of different cost structures, you know, to businesses in the world. And I would say that a lot of them, like, like the, the price of the storage medium, um, really that relevant to the business. Um, if you are running a big business and you have 100 gigabytes of data to store or even 10 terabytes of data to store, it does make a difference, whether you're, I mean, to be honest, whether you're storing it in disk or flash or memory for that matter. Um, so 
So that's things that I guess I see over and over again is people initially come in and sort of say, well, I don't know if I want to spend the money to store my data in Flash because it's like, you know, X times more expensive. Um, but I think that, you know, a lot of the time, a lot of times we sort of convince people that that's not the right way to think about it. That actually, you should actually go look at how much data you're talking about storing and then actually just try to put uh, some numbers on it, some actual dollars. And if it's, if it's $20,000, if it's $2,000, or if it's $100,000, whatever, like that should be asked. You should be asking whether the cost is worth it, not you know, whether the factor is worth it. And I what you're seeing from people, even like, like Facebook and like Apple, are saying, you know, even though the price is, is astronomical, the, the benefits are astronomical as well, and so, and so we're going to do it. And, and um, I think that's sort of an important way to look at the, the cost issue. I totally agree. I've seen uh, a couple of case studies where people are running a, a cluster of 50 nodes, and just by adding solid-state drives, they've been able to run the cluster on 25 nodes. And that really makes it easier to manage and save heat and housing and, and all these things. So uh, I totally agree. It's, it's not just a matter of counting the bytes and figuring out the cost, but really figure out what your SLAs are and how many nodes you need to have for that SLA uh, to service it and, and what people are really finding. Uh, from what I'm saying is that by using solid-state drives, they can use a lot fewer nodes in their NoSQL clusters. So, I can chime in on that for a second. That's, oh, um, yeah. you know, fitting this use case, uh, I'd like to echo as well. Um, we recently, it, Flash itself is outperforming itself, um, if that makes sense. We're not, I'm not just seeing rotational versus Flash, but Flash versus Flash. When our older customers is now refreshing their infrastructure, and they're going from um, some of the first Samsung drives, SS805s, where they'd put four 100 gig drives in a machine, and they had a cluster size of about 40 nodes, and driving the same load now with uh, Intel S3700s at uh, 12 drives. Um, and uh, they're taking a cluster size reduction from in the 40s to under 10. Um, so, and, and giving themselves headroom. Just and that's changing the more modern flash drive. Absolutely. They're going from 400 gig to uh, nearly, I think it's nearly uh, 2 tera per node. Um, it's not that much more expensive due to the drop. Uh, and uh, they're getting uh, over 100,000 database transactions per second per node. So uh, we're spike. So um, yeah. uh, all that means, you know, Flash is doing, Flash is even beating Flash. It's great. great. <laughs> yeah, I'd like to echo echo what he said there and give a special shout out to Intel on the uh, CS3700 drives because those things are, are pretty awesome um, from our perspective here. Uh, as I said, I, I have we have virtually every consumer SSD that's been introduced to the market in the last four years. Um, and what Intel has done with this drive is they, they've brought basically consumer, consumer SSD-like pricing at, a, you know, maybe a 2x premium, um, but brought, like, in enterprise performance, really viable, just in every way. So they have, I think, a, a recognition for that effort. Here. One thing to talk about. On, on price issue, if you don't mind. Yeah, let's, let's I do think, that, and then yeah. let's get to some of the questions, because we got some good questions rolling okay. in for our group here. So go ahead. All right. Uh, the, I think the thing that's interesting in today's world is is, is Amazon uh, E2 and maybe other cloud providers, because nowadays, running an application on, you pick the technology. It doesn't need to be MySQL or Mongo. It could be data storage technology. They've been running on EC2 for a while, and then on CBS or ephemeral disks, and they might have guaranteed IOPS. I live in a world where if you're technically savvy, you can create servers and you can number to EC2 instances that are flash-based and have a lot of money, run a test and see just how much better performance you can get and, and know the price immediately. Right? Al Amazon's going to give you the calculator and really different. You know, I have a picture on my phone of when I benchmarked some Fusion IO and, and RAM cards four years ago, and, and Back then, you begged the vendor to get a sample to try something out, and you wait, and you install it, and you configure it. And weeks and time, and, and that's what's really changed here is for, for a couple hours effort, you can see the difference in performance without having to spend much money at all. You know, it's bumping your budget for the day 50 or 60 bucks 
to an Amazon cluster with SSDs for a couple of hours. So that's interesting in that you can you can now your app behaves regardless of data technology on their Flash or Flash at all um, virtualized environments. Yeah, so uh, clouds are good ways to test uh, architecture um, without yeah. going to capital to, to buy the drives. And if it were out there, you, you might have a good chance of getting it to work effectively within your data center, too, or, or even use it. So uh, let's jump sure. to these questions here. Um, we uh, have a, uh, in, if everybody has their Q&A panel, you can see some of the uh, questions that are coming up. And I'm just going to pick out some that, that we can answer quickly. Um, are people applying uh, uh, RAID architectures to configurations of the solid state drives? Anybody want to take that one? If no one will. Go ahead. Um, so uh, this this gets into actually a, a kind of a, a interesting topic, which is um, so what we do at Aerospike, and I'm sure the other guys would agree, is uh, in order to get a lot of parallelism, you want the software to do a lot of the management of uh, I/O queues and uh, workloads itself. Um, which works kind of in, in, in uh, contrast to having a RAID card or the operating system trying to manage things like the RAID stripe, um, RAID stripe size. So uh, what we've found in general is uh, we require our customers to get that RAID card out of the way as much as possible and to turn on RAID and to present JBOD interfaces. Uh, with the recent uh, LSI cards, it's very important to use the fast path uh, what's called the LSI Fast Path, and we have some notes on our website, and I did a high scalability blog post if you're those are who are a follower of that blog. So uh, I would say RAID as a, t as a concept, you need to spread the workload, um, but the standard RAID striping mechanisms and standard RAID cards are really getting in the way from our experience. So it's all about uh, doing that at the database level and having the database really understand a bit more about uh, data layout. Yes, so so uh, raids tend to hide the tr the details of how things are actually happening, and databases need that information to really optimize the I/O, and that's pretty consistent across a lot of the systems uh, we're seeing also. So that that makes sense. Um, uh, another question: uh, How important is the block size uh, when people are are doing things? Do you guys customize block sizes for I/O and things like that? An operating system with 4K block sizes really doesn't apply when you're working with some of these uh, big data systems, uh, Hadoop with their 64 megabyte block sizes? Yeah, I'll, I'll try that one. Um, I, I think it's somewhat important, but I, I think what you'll find a lot of people are doing using block sizes of basically 4 to 8K. And um, this basically has to do with what I sometimes call the characteristic size of a storage device. And basically, the size where marginal cost of the seek roughly equals the marginal cost of the bytes read. So, for example, in an SSD, if you uh, read a one megabyte block, the seek is going to cost you far less than the reading one megabyte will. But on a rotational disk, um, you actually can you know seek to a spot in you know read you know hundreds of k in about roughly the same amount of time. So. Um, one that you see with, with flash drives is if you can read a gigabyte a second and do 100,000, uh, 100,000, you know, re reads or writes per second, um, then you can sort of back back out what the sort of workable sort of characteristic size of that device would be. And usually for for a OLTP type workload, you want to have a bunch size, which is that size. So it sort of we sort of come back to where we started a long time ago, in that for makes in a lot of cases, and in four is the sort of native block size of a lot of these SSDs. So that's that's what a lot of these systems use. But I, that's how I think about it. Think about it. Okay. I chime in on one point uh, quickly. Um, it, when people talk about those kind of block sizes, they're often talking about the file system block sizes. Um, and so uh, it, you know, most databases, uh, older school databases, Oracle certainly. Uh, bypassing the file system is one of your first optimizations. So uh, one of the tricks of a, a flash optimized database is to really uh, do the kind of trade-offs um, that uh, Dave was just talking about and, and pick the right block size for the right moment. Uh, but it's going to be using direct access. So your, uh, your uh, operator doesn't necessarily have the uh, ability to change that. Okay. Um, has a question here. Uh, do you guys know of any uh, uh, studies about uh, different 
uh, decision, failure rates and performance, um, and, and predictive wear analysis uh, on these devices? Or are these devices so new that there aren't uh, good third-party objective studies yet? I have an anecdote. <laughs> Go ahead. Uh, I, I, we've personally run two, had two 96 SSD banks fail in highly correlated ways. Um, we, <laughs> in, in, in other words, we can the next, uh, the next day after leaving our cluster running some tests over the weekend, which was a cluster with 96 SSDs, and we had uh, over 20 failures. Um, of lives, ir irrecoverable failures. So I, I won't name the vendor, just, you know, I'd, I guess um, read an email or something, but um, these stories are not uh, unique. I've talked to many people that have these stories, which I think is why, as an industry, all of us are so glad that we have um, somebody with, you know, the resources and credentials of Intel and some of these other vendors and a little bit more maturity in this space. Because, um, you know, averages don't make sense in these contexts. Um, you know, old spin drives have these nice bathtub curves of, you know, they starting in, you know, Google has some awesome data about this. But I would say if, if you're running, the, you know, of the same SSD in a big, big cluster, um, you, should, you should try to make sure it's from a vendor that, that you uh, trust. Okay. Well, we're coming up to the top of our hour here. Uh, is there any closing thoughts that you guys have, uh, future directions, predictions on when we'll uh, stop using rotational drives for most database transactions? Last, next next here. Uh, my prediction is three years. Okay, three years. Anybody else? Brian. <laughs> Predictions are, are always interesting. I, I think three to five years is, is it'll, it'll be interesting to see what happens in the flash and SSD market to see, you know, there's already some stratification between consumer enterprise class and then high end enterprise class, and, and maybe there'll only be more, more in between uh, the various lines, just like there are in spinning disks. You can get a terabyte for 60 bucks, or you can get a terabyte for, for you know, dollars enterprise grade on, a, on spinning disks. And I think. That's going to you in the in the flash world. Okay, you really get what you pay for in many cases, uh, and optimizing for different types of workloads. Then, mm -hmm. all right, Dave, any thoughts? Uh, oh, years, no predictions. Um, you know, at Foundation DB, we have already pluggable storage engines that work um, with me and SSD. And I think, if anything, in the coming years, we'll be adding support for rotational disks, believe it or not. Oh, um, but um, that's just because there's always going to be tiers of data that are hot or cold, and you just can't ground that. But I think what I'm seeing is that the SSD represents a spot for a lot of applications that's only growing. And so I think I think so only it's booting into memory and eating into rotational disks, I, I believe. And so I think that that sweet spot's going to continue to go, and that's my only, only prediction. Fantastic. Okay. Well, I've got one, one point about this after my short prediction. Um, what I love about SSD and Flash is it allows application developers, uh, you know, forgive me for saying, to be a little sloppier. Um, they can write code that maybe does a little more seeks and is a little less hand optimized, and build some great UIs and great proof of concept, and just know that uh, you know sort of that the hardware guys are going to help them out. I'm seeing more interesting apps, more interesting optimizations, um, uh, be, just because you know the power of SSD can be behind it. Okay, good. Well, we're top of our. I just wanted to thank our three guests, Dave and Brian and Tim, for their great contributions. Uh, and we'll look forward to uh, other NoSQL Now uh, webinar series next month. Um, and I want to especially reach out to uh, thank uh, Shannon Kemp and Tony Law for uh, hosting us. And we'll look forward to seeing you guys in the future. Thank you again. Bye-bye. Uh, thanks, Dan. Thanks, and thanks to Tim and Dave, and, and thanks to all of our attendees who were always so interactive, which I just love. Again, I'll, I'll reiterate Dan's sentiments, and I hope everyone has a great day. Bye now. Thanks. Goodbye. Later, Chaz.